All right, so we're here. Um, we're going to talk about bypassing client-side controls, and the first half of this is just one long hands-on exercise. So the point is, um, it is very strange that this would ever happen anyway. But it is very common that a server has data and the client is doing something like shopping, putting things in a cart and then checking out. And it is the server will send data to the client, trusting the client to repeat that data back later. Now this all comes from the fact that HTTP is stateless, so you need to somehow preserve the state of the client. But um, it would, would seem strange that someone would send important data to the client and then trust it to come back unaltered later. That just seems kind of foolish, but it just turns out to be convenient. Um, and developers typically assume that the client won't modify the data if you make it so it doesn't appear in their browser visibly. They won't see uh, anything to click on or any place to type to modify it. So you would imagine that most people won't modify it. And this is the same kind of security thinking that Microsoft championed until 2002, where you do not attempt to withstand malicious attacks. You only try to make it so honest users that are trying to use your product as intended can succeed. And you regard that as good enough. And this certainly is the first aspect of security, availability. Make it work at all, but it doesn't have the other aspects of security like confidentiality and integrity in the face of a malicious attack. Um, and the point here is, if you have a session stored somewhere on the server, you know, instead of storing all the data relevant to the user in that session, you can store just a smaller thing, like an ID token. Um, and the you app you've deployed might be dispersed across many servers and it might use third-party content, so it's very difficult to arrange for all those contents to reach the server resources where you would store things. So the easiest thing is just bounce it off the client. So every request contains all the data. And another thing, of course, is if you modify your server-side code, you're going to affect all the products of your company. So that is probably a lengthy, painful process to get approval to put more stuff in the server-side code, whereas just making your app send data to the user and receive it back is easy. And, and so for, for general issues of convenience, you often have this kind of nonsense where you're going to buy a phone and it says price 449 and the, what it does is it sends the price to you in a hidden field and then when you submit the request, so you have this input type equals hidden with the price in it and when you send your request, the, um, the request contains that information. So let's go through some of these examples and this is project eight, just make all these things work. It is the easiest project in the course, especially as you'll see, this is very easy stuff to do but it certainly is stuff you should know how to do. So we're going to do a few of these. This, by the way, um, I got a complaint from the college last week, and I should explain this because it's actually kind of entertaining. And uh, the solution, it is, uh, okay, so I gave you guys this homework for command injection. And in particular, I gave you this one that I thought was a lot of fun, and I also did it at DEF CON and every place else where you exploit image magic. <coughs> So image magic is a real vulnerability came out in April and everybody freaked out and within a few weeks they all rushed out patches to your image magic and if you didn't put on the patch there are all these exploits flying around. Okay, so what happened is about two weeks ago a student told me this page was gone. They couldn't go to this page and do the homework and I looked and it was gone but the rest of my site was up. So I said, well that's kind of weird. I looked at the permissions, the permissions were right. So then I just made a copy of the page and it was gone and I started deleting big chunks of the page to see what part was making the problem and it turned out that this page here that demonstrates the exploit, um, assuming it's back up, which it may not be. Anyway, it was the code that demonstrated the exploit here, the code that showed what you should inject. That was triggering a filter at my server. My hosting provider apparently has some kind of generic traffic filtering, and finally, six months after it's all over, the, the, eight, the layer seven firewalls have finally figured out that they should be blocking this stuff. So they blocked it. So all I had to do was to HTML encode the exploit and sail right through. Now, um, so then it looks like it's down again, so I'll have to like restore it from backup or something. Anyway, um, the, uh, so the next, about a week after that, I got an email from the college saying, you are sending attacks, the lab is attacking people, and we're attacking people back. We saw a bunch of attacks going from the lab to the server at DigitalOcean, and we complained to the hosting provider that you shouldn't let those jerks attack the college. That guy's attacking the college. And I said, guys, it's me. It's this <laughs> homework. It's not an attack. It is that your firewalls are only six months out of date detecting garbage that doesn't even matter anymore, telling you it's an attack, and telling you the people reading the instructions are receiving the attack. And anyway, so I said, well, I talked to them. They're saying, you should, like, buy your own DSL line and not be on the City College Network anymore in the hacking lab because you're sending attack traffic out and we're going to be responsible for it. And I said, well, well, all right. So uh, it occurred to me that we might, might as well just use HTTPS. Now this 
points out how completely pointless the whole thing is. I mean, they're allowing encrypted tunnels out of the college. We allow VPNs, we allow HTTPS, so we're not filtering anything that matters. However, just to avoid bothering them, I switched my server, so now it's HTTPS. So we might as well get used to that. Anyway, so... Um, it gives them the deniability. They didn't know the traffic was going on, so they can't be held accountable. Yes, so they, it they does. They see it in their log, someone's like, you should have done something. Uh, yes, perhaps. It's, uh, but I think everybody has this same issue with their company. There's, there's an awful lot of security theater in the world. Anyway, so um, let's go to attack.samsclass.info, which is where I put this one. All right. And it may be that my hosting provider took me offline because of complaints from a college again on the other server, but it wasn't this server. All right, so I put this thing here called Client Site Controls Demonstration. This is now all HTTPS to avoid offending the tender ears of our security department here. So, um, all right, so here's the first one. Buy an iPhone, price quantity. So if you, the thing to do, of course, is run this through Burp to see what's going on. So I've got Firefox running and Burp running. All right, and let's clear all this old stuff. All right, and now go back and let's try, these are a series of challenges and let me fix that, we're gonna get there later. Uh, that is this hogwash down here, which is bloody awesome, but not appropriate right at the moment. All right, so let me refresh this page. All right, and yes, okay, good. All right, oops, still didn't refresh correctly. How rude. Um, shift refresh? There we go, all right. So that's the way this page is supposed to look. Let me blow it up. All right, so there's a whole series of challenges. There's seven of them, and each one has a form, and here's what you're supposed to do. So the phone costs 449 bucks, but you're supposed to buy it for 50. All right, so, so, if I, so the way to do this is start with a legitimate request. I wanna buy one phone, say, and you have to run it through your proxy. Now, when you run it through your proxy, you will see an error message saying that the HTTPS certificate is no good, and you have to bypass that and store the certificate which uh, they, I put it in the instructions. Might as well get used to that. Uh, especially, I'm kind of tender about this because as we, uh, the last time I taught the Android app security class, I found out like 15% of all Android apps have turned off HTTPS. So they just pretend to use HTTPS. They don't validate certificates because they can't do what you're gonna have to do in this project, which is click, okay, save exception. They can't figure out how to do that. So they turn off um, certificate validation to make it easier for their developers to develop the app. This seems to me like it's not asking too much to teach your developers to store a burp certificate, but apparent, anyway, for some reason, they don't, a lot of them. Anyway, so um, we are gonna, so what's going on here is this thing is listening on 127.0.0.1.8080, and it's creating a, a certificate for every HTTPS host, and making a fake certificate. So if you go to my website, and you look at its certificate, um, which should be more information, there, this website, is verified by Portswigger, which is not VeriSign or any real web, uh, CA, it is the people who made BERT. So I've told my browser to trust this certificate. And so it continues to use HTTPS, and since the certificate is a fake certificate from here, I can see the traffic in BERT because BERT is man in the middle attacking it with a fake certificate. So anyway, now I buy a phone here, one <coughs> phone, submit, and it says, okay, you bought one phone, but you're trying to get a phone for $50, this one costs 449 so look at the request that did it. Um, hidden three. Oh, I'm wrong page, all right. Go up to here. All right, this one. Finally, hidden one. Okay, this is the request that did it. Now, um, the raw request is here. And the only thing about this is it puts the header fields up here and it puts the data fields down there. So if you look at the parameters, you can see it sent the quantity and the price up to the server, which is the way this was designed. It had a hidden field. So even though what I see to buy the phone is this, the price is just a fixed quantity, there's a hidden field called price that has that number. And when I submit it, it sends that up to the server, which is what you see here. So all you have to do is um, intercept this, go back to intercept, <coughs> intercept this, and now you can modify it on the way out and change that price. And then forward it and turn off the interception and now you bought a phone for 50 bucks. So this is the problem with sending data to the client and then trusting the client later to send it back unaltered. There is no reason at all that the client doesn't alter it just because you don't display it on the screen. So that's how easy that one is. 
But that, believe me, believe me, that's the hard way to do it. You'll see. Um, and there's another one where you have a cookie. You can have data in a cookie. So you click here to get a discount. Then you buy a phone here, and you get a discount of 10. Okay, but you want to get a discount of 100. So again, go back one step. Um, turn on intercept. Submit it. And again, you have the cookie contains parameters discount. If you look at it in the raw structure, the cookie is up here. It has name value pairs. And there it is, CFDUID, which is Cloudflare or something or other. Then it has discount equals 10. So you could just change this to 100 right here, or you can let Burp make it a little easier for you and do it here, where Burp has chosen the parameters in the cookie and made them visible. And it's the same thing. You change this, then you forward that, turn off the intercept, and you bought a phone with a discount of 100. Um, the cookie is of course, not a safe place to put the data anymore in any place else. Then there's URL parameters. This one here, you don't even need Burke. So you buy it for 449, you submit it, and you look at the URL. Hidden, quantity equals one, price equals 449. Just right up there. So you can just change the price right there <laughs> and buy a phone for 50. Um, all right. These are all just making the same mistake in different disguises. Then there's a referrer. Like, see, a lot of people, have a page and there's this fundamental idea that you can trust people in some trusted zone. So people think it's okay to have a firewall at the edge of the network and not have any firewalls inside because we trust anybody in the building. And so people think if they come from my site, they're okay. It's people coming from the outside I don't trust. So you can use the referrer. The referrer tells you where they came from, right? So if I submit to buy my phone, it says, no, you can't buy a phone. You can only buy a phone if you came from apple.com, see? So what you have to do, of course, is intercept this, submit it, and then look at the referrer header here, which we were talking about on the quiz. There is a referrer header, which right now says you're coming from attack.samslash.info, and you have to make this apple.com. So they appear to have come from Apple, and a lot of developers believe they can trust that referrer, just like the cops believe they can trust the um, uh, from phone number in your 911 calls. It's the same kind of mistake with a from address in an email. All those things are just carried along and never verified anywhere. So you can put any kind of lie in there. And last semester we found an unauthenticated SMTP server on City College a couple of semesters ago as a vulnerability. And I used it to send email that appeared to come from Obama at the White House. Because you can just put anything in the from. Anyway, so that should do it. Now you forward that, quit intercepting it. And now you bought an iPhone from Apple.com. So, um, then here's another one you can do. If you don't want people to buy too many phones, you can put a length limit. If I put in one and I keep typing, nothing happens. Now that's because if I view the source of this, um, I think I can do it this way. Uh, inspect element. All right. Um, expand it. There, um, let's see, expand this. I'm losing my mind. Expand the form, there we are. So what happened here is I have quantity max length equals one. You can only put one character in there. So I can't put in a bigger number than 10. So that's true and that's cool. So I'm living, So what you do is the same thing you always do. Turn on intercept, send a submit. And so the form won't let me put in a number bigger than one, but I can just change it after the form is done with it to six and forward that and quit intercepting and then I get six phones. Um, I guess I wanted 10, but you get the idea. Um, and here's script-based validation. This you see a lot of. Whenever people have a form with name, address, social security number, and all this hogwash, they will always have a script to validate it. And so um, this one here, the script is actually up in the header. Let me just view the source of this page and we'll scroll around. All right, here's the script, validate the form. All it does is look at the quantity and if it's bigger than five, it's too large, and it returns false. That's all the script does. And to execute the script, um, I used this thing, script-based validation, this stuff down here. And what you do is you have action equals hidden, method equals post, and on submit equals return um, validate form. What this does is when you submit, it executes this function, and if the function returns false, it does not do the action. And if the function is true, then it does the action. This is how JavaScript validators work. So it's going to run this validate form JavaScript validator up here, and the only thing it's going to validate is that the quantity is not larger than five. So if I try to buy 
one phone, it works. But if I try to buy 10 phones, it doesn't work. It pops up a box saying something quantity too large. And when you click OK, it doesn't submit it. So you apparently can't get more than one phone, but of course you can. There are many tricks to do this one. One thing you could do is turn off JavaScript in your browser so the script doesn't run. That'll do it. Another, but of course, the simplest thing is the same old trick here. Just ignore the browser and catch it on the network before it leaves your computer. So the browser is all done, JavaScript has done its job, and now I change it here. Um, so the browser doesn't know that happened, and now I get six phones. There are many other solutions to that. You could also save a copy of the page locally and modify the JavaScript. Um, you could also capture the re lo reload the page and get the HTML on the way in, in BERT, and modify the JavaScript. So what actually gets in the browser doesn't have the JavaScript in it. There are just many ways to do it. You know, this idea that you served up JavaScript to the user and they ran it, you can trust what happened out here because they ran that JavaScript, is just fatally flawed in so many ways. You delivered that to the user and you have no reason to believe that they actually ran the script you sent them. Um, anyway, so on the last one here is a disabled field. Here's another thing you can do. I can buy a phone but I'm just going to disable this field. It shows the price, but I can't click in there. I can't type anything. That's pretty cool. Now, yeah, go ahead. The simplest way to modify, let me do it, let me modify it on the fly. Let's do that. Let's go here and, ref okay, let's turn intercept on. And by the way, what I've done is I've turned intercept on not only for outgoing requests, but you turn it on for server responses too, which is not on by default. So I said, Turn it on to any response. If, I, if the request was intercepted, intercept the response too. So now, when I refresh the page, with a shift to make sure I get the whole thing, all right, it's going to send a request and intercept it, and I'm going to forward that, and then there comes the response, and it's going to stop that. And here's the response, which is loading up the page. And what I could do is get rid of this stuff here. There. And now forward that in here. It might. Let's see what happens. Yep, I might have to do something a little cleverer than that, like always return true. Let's see how it works. So now if I put in 10 and submit, um, it looks like it worked. I'm going to quit. You know, yep, now I've got 10 iPhones. That seemed to work. Just make it so the function isn't there. And a smarter thing, like you said, would be to just make the function always return true or something. But apparently, it moves ahead if the function isn't there. So that's the kind of thing. That's these are. Um, you, that's the point. The idea that you served up the page to the user and you can trust that script to run is just really flawed thinking. The fact is, you don't own the client's computer, and they could be doing anything. Anyway, then there's disabled fields here. So the way this thing looks in HTML is um, I've got it here. If I go down to the bottom, okay, here's the HTML. So this has a field called disabled. Disabled equals true, which means it's got a value, it can't be used. Now this also means when you send the request, it is not gonna send the price. So a disabled field is a field that the developer is not using anymore. So um, let's submit it. And now I bought, I forgot to give it a quantity. Let's give it one. Okay, now I bought one iPhone for 449. Let's look at what happened here. You go to HTTP history. Here's the, um, should have been hidden seven. Let me clear this old stuff. I don't know what happened. Clear history. Oh, I'm in the wrong browser, aren't I? Ah, that'll do it. All right. I got to use the browser that goes through the proxy, or I won't see any data in the proxy. So I submit that. Now I bought one iPhone for 449. So here is the post that did that, and you can see I didn't even send the price up. It sent quantity. Price is a disabled field, which means it's not used. So under normal conditions, the disabled field is something that apparently is not used at all by the server, and, but the fact that it's there suggests that in some earlier version of the software it was used, and therefore you might imagine that some part of the scripts might still be using it. So in this case, what you have to do, if you want to add that field back in, is you have to turn on intercept, and then submit one, and then when you catch it, you have to add the uh, price field here that doesn't exist, so you do that with add. You have to add another field, price, and give it a value like 50. All right, and now send it up and turn off intercept, and now you get a phone for 50, because it is using that field if it's there. If it's not there, it uses something else, and that's, uh, so this is where you see a clue in this disabled field of an appendix that's been imperfectly cut out of the code, and that suggests a hole you might be able to get in. 
So anyway, by the way, the last thing I wanted to show you, which will make you laugh at this entire project, there is an automatic overcome of everything in Burp. Down here in response modification, you can just turn all this stuff off. It will, Burp will just automatically remove JavaScript, remove field limits, uh, enable all disabled fields, unhide all hidden fields, and prominently display them. So if you turn on this stuff, this project becomes incredibly trivial. Turn on that stuff, refresh the page, shift refresh, and now the price is just right there. <laughs> so make it 50 and buy one. Uh, that's right, this, this homework could take you like 10 seconds. The cookie you have to do, the URL, that was easy enough anyway. The referrer you have to do some work on, the link limit. There's just no link limit anymore. It just, they just turned it off. <laughs> they just removed the link limit field on the way to your browser, so it's not there. Uh, the scripts just don't run. Ha ha. And the disabled field is just enabled. Because they just watched for those tags and tripped them out on the way in. <laughs> So it's actually pretty awesome. And this is why everybody loves Burp. Anyway, um, all right. So let me just go to my slides, which I think we pretty much covered, and see that's how you change the price with Burp. You can change the discount amount in the cookie. The URL parameters are ridiculous. They're just sitting right there in the URL for you to modify. Now, that's not always true. Yeah? Ah, I will get there, but actually, the, in general, what you do is you have client-side validation, and then you check it on the server. And if you get invalid data on the server, that proves they're doing some kind of hacking. And you ought to put that in your intrusion detection system as a alert or a log. Maybe you just want to break the connection or disable their account. That's evidence that they're doing something bad. And by the way, it's kind of hideous, but they're actually breaking the law at that point. If they, as I learned, the CFAA says if they are doing anything on your site that you don't like them doing, it's you're breaking the law pretty much. Yeah. There are users that disable JavaScript completely, so they wouldn't get the client side validation. So that's right. I'm not sure if just saying they're they they can try to argue that. Bad. Yeah, they they can right. anyway. You you can argue about the legal side, but you're right. It's possible. There's some people actually don't have JavaScript, but I think very few. And I think if I was a mean prosecutor, I could say that turning on JavaScript like using Tor is evidence of guilt. And that has happened in court. They've said that evidence of encryption software, presence of Tor, and using Linux and things like that are all evidence <coughs> of evil intent. Um, they haven't, I think, successfully prosecuted someone with just that evidence, but that is considered a negative mark. If you do those things, that makes you like an evil hacker. So that's why I say what really happens to you depends on how you present yourself and how good an attorney you get and how well you cooperate with your attorney. It is possible for a lot of what we do to be perceived as suspicious. And the more I have to do with the courts and the criminal justice system, the more I'm appalled at how they have zero comprehension of technology whatsoever. And they really will believe statements like this. And there are court transcripts that say that this guy's using that evil Linux that makes him a hacker. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, so here's actually, you can have URL parameters that are still not visible in the bar. For example, you can put parameters in an image source tag, and it will go up to the server. Um, you can put it in an iframe tag. It can be in the form action tag. There are pop-up windows and mobile devices that don't show the URL bar at all, while <coughs> increasingly in use. So there are a lot of things where even if your parameter's in the URL, it's not easily, ob obviously available for the user to modify. Of course, they can do it with a proxy, but it is the thing, it's not always as blindingly obvious and stupid as that. You have the price just sitting in front of you. And then of course the referrer header, unfortunately a lot of developers trust it, thinking it means that I know what page they came from and there's no reason particularly to trust it. And then there's opaque data. Sometimes they choose to conceal the data. Like this thing has value equals E7, D6, all this hogwash. Um, you can choose, instead of just putting up the quantity as 10 to encrypt it or obfuscate it, you know, like base 64 or something, so what travels up is mathematically altered. And that, of course, might stop you. Just the question is, how good is your math? If you're a good cryptographer, they could scramble it in some way that you really can't unscramble it. So then you just try to hunt and hope they made a mistake. If you know the plain text, you might be able to deduce the algorithm, like we did with Stitcher last time, where you try different passwords and you see the pattern. Um, you might be able to find functions someplace if they get plain text you can control. You can often replay the scrambled text without unscrambling it and get the value you want. Um, and of course, 
you can then try um, malformed strings over long values. You know, there are various attacks you can try, but unless they made a pretty foolish mistake, that's a pretty strong defense, really. If they're, it's a, HTTPS is scrambling it with good security, and if they're using some other kind of scrambling, it's just a question of how well did they do it. Um, ASP.NET has a hidden field created by default in ASP applications, and it creates something called the view state, and you can add parameters to the view state, and then it obfuscates them in a big block of code, value equals W, E, P, E, W, and what that does is it's a base64 encoding of things like this. It's not actually that brilliant. It's like um, HTTP basic authentication, but it is an attempt to address this, where we're going to move the parameters up in some scrambled, non-obvious way, so it'll be harder for someone to modify them, even if they have a tool like Burp. Um, and here's the decoded view state that shows price 39 and on it goes. Um, you can actually add MAC protection, a 20 byte keyed hash at the end of the structure where it will not accept the structure unless it is validated. And that's MAC codes are hashed and then encrypted with a secret key that you don't have. So that's actually very secure. You cannot unpack it, modify the value and make a valid repacking. And they recommend in the book always turning this option on to use the keyed hash in ASP.NET and then that is a strong countermeasure. Nobody can really do this to your stuff in Burp anymore because they can't see the number and change it in any way that will be accepted by the server. Um, all right, and there are parsers. Here's the thing you can put in Burp Suite that will automatically unpack and parse this. And let me uh, blow it up. It actually, it breaks it up into parameters by adding this, this plugin um, <coughs> into Burp. And then it tells you Mac is not enabled. And now you see the values and you can change them. If Mac was enabled, I think this plugin would not be able to succeed in unpacking it and repacking it in the way the server would take it. So yeah? What is Mac? A Mac is a hash value of something, then encrypted with a secret key, very commonly used in um, uh, financial transactions. And the, uh, that means unless you can get the secret key, you cannot alter the value. It'll fail authentication. All right. And so then there's forms that only allow one character. You can defeat that with a proxy. So just, yeah. I'm just kind of curious on the server side, what yeah. kind of defense? I mean, like well, when you're saying, oh, limit the, um, you know, you can only have one digit. It's right. Like, can you just check that on the server? You can, and that's what you should do. Just check right. it on the server. That's right. So whatever you did on the client, you have to do it again on the server, and you can see why a developer would typically feel like that is foolish until they understand. They'll say, well, I already did it. Why am I doing it again? But you have to do it again. That's a Microsoft technology, ASP, yeah. They had that built into ASP, and that seems like a pretty good solution to all this. That would certainly raise the bar. All right, so you got forms, yeah. Isn't that the standard now, uh, isn't that the standard for security that we are still checking this on the server side? Because if we are accepting, let's say, API calls, That's we, right. we need to have some kind of validation on the server. It okay. certainly should be that way, and it very often isn't. Now people keep making, the problem is there's many, many developers rushing things to press, companies exploding, and there's just endless chain of new people making the old stupid mistakes again and again. But yeah, this is, people are, it's not as bad as it used to be, but it still happens. Mm -hmm. Especially now with the Internet of Things, people are going to be making the old mistakes much faster than ever. <laughs> um, so You're saying that ASP has server-side and client-side validation built into the language? Um, ASP.NET built in this, um, this encoding it where it can't be altered in the language. So it is an option to use the view state to move it up. So that's actually pretty good. They built in a good way to transfer it, which is hard to hack. And other languages would leave it up to you to write your own, which is not as sensible. So, all right. By the way, if you refresh a page, you will often not get a fresh copy of the page. You'll just, it'll just tell you it's not modified. So you can pitch shift refresh to get a real copy of the page, or you can go in burp and harvest out the um, the response, because what does this is this if modified since tag. When you're refreshing a page and your browser already has a copy in the cache, it sends a different kind of get request. It sends a get request with if modified since. So don't bother sending it to me if it hasn't been modified lately, and you can just strip that out in burp on the way out, and then you'll always get a fresh copy of the page. That's also what this e tag thing is. You see right there, the fourth line is e tag 86. That is a sort of serial number to specify the version of the page so it knows which version it has. It sends the e-tag up and it says, has it changed? And the server compares the e-tag to the e-tag of the version on the server, and that's how it knows whether to bother sending the page or to just send you a, um, a 304 response saying, I didn't bother sending you the page because you've already got it. This saves bandwidth for everybody, but for people like us that are testing and developing things, we very often want to really reload it, even though we already have it because we're tampering with the request and responses and we don't want it to just trust the copy and the cache. Um, 
So shift refresh does it, or you can use burp. Here's script-based validation, like we said. If you can defeat it with burp by just changing the value after the script runs. Um, so if you're going to have JavaScript used for input validation, um, you can submit data that would have, so the way you use this as a pen tester is you take data that would have failed validation, put it in with a proxy, and then determine whether validation is actually performed on the server. You can find out if they're on the server, and if multiple fields are validated, be sure and put valid data in everything except one, because if there's like five mistakes, it might just detect the first mistake and then stop, and there might be an error in mistake number four that you didn't test. So the best thing is to have only one wrong data at a time and test them all to make sure that they really test everything on the server, because you're looking for the place where somebody overlooked something. Um, so anyway, the proper use, of course, there is, that's something I think that Java side, uh, JavaScript user side validation is useless, but it's not useless. It improves the experience of the user, right? You're filling out a form, it's long and complicated, the JavaScript responds immediately, it doesn't have to go to the server. This means you get faster response helping you fill out the form, and the server doesn't waste a lot of time processing time or bandwidth sending corrupt signals up to the server. So it can be useful as long as you don't trust it. As long as it, it makes it for like your normal users that are not trying to hack you, it helps them more efficiently get the thing ready and submit it, and then you have to check it on the server to see if the user is really trying to hack you. So, you know, and I can see why this is not a lesson that developers would naturally take to. You have to write your code twice. Why do you have to write your code twice? <laughs> anyway, but you do. Um, all right, and we talked about disabled elements can't be changed and they're not sent to the server, but you can add them and send it to the server as if it was enabled, and then you might find that some part of the server software is still using that, and they disabled it in the client and didn't really disable it on the server, which would be another one of those things that a lazy developer might reasonably say, well, I've disabled it. I don't need to bother fixing the code on the server because I disabled it here. It's gone. The same kind of thinking. Um, or even more likely, I only have control over the form that goes to the user, and the server software is controlled by some other team, and I can't change it, but I'll disable it here, and that will prevent it from being misunderstood at the server side. <coughs> All right, so like I say, response modification, this is the, the golden key of response modification, you check these boxes and then Burke will take all these things off and make this project incredibly trivial. So we're down to the first batch of eye clickers. Come grab one if you need one. I'll get set here. All right. There it is, all right. Start new session. Yes. All right, good. Yes, tell me something I don't want to know. Okay. All right, which one is the most difficult to defeat? Guess I'll create a 35. All right, and the opaque data might actually be pretty hard to defeat. Like if you actually use that ASP.NET thing correctly, the rest of these are all almost completely a waste of time, trivial to defeat. That's just a question of how good you are at making it opaque. All right, um, all right. which one is not sent to the server with your post request? the disabled field doesn't get sent. All right. All right. Which one directly tells you whether the user clicked the link on your site or came in from somewhere else? All 
right, because I quit. So that's the referrer, of course, that's what it's for. So you can see which of your ads are working. Now it's not perfect, but that's the porphys of it. All right, and um, which one removes both, most client-side validation automatically? Burps response modification. You can do it manually or you can do it automatically, but it'll just strip out the code out right out of the page. So let's take a 10 minute break, then we'll carry on. I'm going to stop this recording. Uh, this is 1429. Yes, chapter 29.